As you all know, last week we, have the, we had the surprising and great news that we have an astronaut among us. This is, yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, very, well, of course, very good news. In my experience as a journalist, I know that astronauts are truly inspiring figures. I, uh, they somehow conjure the idea of discovery, the idea of wonder, and it works for everyone for children, for adults, for the lay public, for the general public, also for scientists. So this is why we asked Sarah to come here and, and tell us her story. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for being here and sharing with us your, your story. Uh, Sarah received her bachelor's degree in biotechnology in 2012 and a master's degree in biomedical and biological research in 2013 both from the University of Leon. She was awarded with several prizes for her academic ex excellence. <clears throat> in 2018, she received a doctorate in molecular biology of cancer and translational medicine from the University of Salamanca. <clears throat> so um, Sara is with us at the CNIO since 2000, 2019, leading a project in the experimental oncology group. I leave the floor to her. So thank you, Sara. Thank you, Monica, for your nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here and have the opportunity to share my crazy story about how I became an astronaut. I feel silly even <laughs> telling this out, out loud, but sharing this with all my colleagues from the CMEO is like a privilege. So I will try to, to tell it the best way. I would like you to tell you about why, why a, a biotechnologist decided to apply for an astronaut, how I made it, and now what? What is going to happen to me now? So I will start from the beginning because I wasn't really familiar with the European Space Agency before they, they post the vacancy for astronauts. I don't know if you are or uh, acknowledge some of the things that they do, but it's an international organization composed by 22 member states, and they have been operating during the five 50 years, and they do almost everything related with, to, with the space sector, from Earth observation to amazing space missions, all related to satellite communication and navigation. They do almost everything. So it's everywhere, the European Space Agency. And it's founded and coordinated by the, the member states, which are those listed here. And one of the things that appealed me the most about this agency and about the astronaut duties is that they are mostly scientists. All the research that is done in the International Space Station have a lot of different applications, most of them related to human and health science. For example, all the, some of the technology for a laser eye surgery has been developed in the International Space Station. Uh, the, the astronauts themselves are like test beds for studies related to elderly because they lose a lot of bone and muscle mass during, because of the microgravity. So there are a lot of different interesting and very cool scientific experiments performed at the, at the ISS, both related to human uh, health, uh, health and also in industry. For example, uh, water recycling, waste uh, management, other clothes, there are a lot of different things. And most of these experiments are designed here on Earth, on Earth of course, by PIs from different universities, and most of them belong to academia throughout all Europe. So it's really interesting, the science that is done there. There is a, currently a roadmap, more than 100 pages, about different experiments that they want to perform there until 2013. So very interesting scientific stuff here. This is like a landscape of all the European astronauts that have had missions to the International Space Station. And here there is a lack of two things, Spanish people and women. We have only one Spanish astronaut, which is Pedro Duque. He all, only had one mission in 2003, promoted from Spain. And we only have one female astronaut inactive, which is Samantha Cristoforetti. But luckily, this has changed now. We have a lot of great women, both in the reserve and the career astronauts. I will talk to you about that later. 
And why? Why uh, to become an astronaut? Because this job is fascinating, but I didn't really acknowledge what an astronaut does, both in space and on Earth. Uh, I know that, okay, they put on top of a rocket and they go to the space, and then what? What they do there? Well, when they are in a flight mission, when they are in space, every single hour is perfectly scheduled. So when they were at, wake, wake up, they have like a, a brief a daily meeting with mission control for the briefing of the day. And then after breakfast and a medical check, they are all, all the day performing experiments. This kind of scientific experiments designed on Earth, it's what they do uh, there. We have like a huge uh, laboratory on board of the ISS, which is the Columbus Laboratory, and it, they have rodents, they have plants, they have fruit flies. And a lot of science uh, is performed there, but related to the natural science and also material science, fluid uh, dynamics, and so on. Another of the activities, the coolest ones maybe, are the spacewalks of the extravehicular activities, EVA, as they are known. When they have to come and go out of the ISS and perform some kind of uh, install, installation of new technology PCs or a different kind of onboard system from the ISS, which is also maintenance in this case. And the most amazing thing, which is uh, looking through the cupola, which is also a, a contribution from the ESA to the International Space Station, and watch the planet Earth from there, which has to be an amazing experience. In the weekends, they have some spare time for listening to music, uh, speaking with their families, and also doing some kind of housekeeping task like vacuum and these things. But also in Earth, the duties of an astronaut are quite amazing. This is a summary of the things they have to do when they are not on board of the ISS, which most is related to education and outreach. As Monica told you before, astronauts are like an inspiring figure, so they have to spread the wonders of science and space through a college, through the young generations, through all the general public. They also give mission support and control to already flying missions, a lot of traveling, and especially a lot of training. The training of an astronaut is very long and very complete. They take like uh, six years to become a fully complete astronaut to uh, capable to perform a space mission. So a lot of learning and a lot of exercise as well. But how, who can apply to, to become an astronaut? Because at least in my mind, you had to be like an aerospace engineer to become an astronaut. But suddenly I read about the job position and it happens that there are many paths to becoming an astronaut. Basically, you need to be involved in a STEM career. That's it. In, in the Apollo era, most of the astronauts were like clones of each other. Um, white, straight men from 25 to 45, most of them pilots, and that's it. But then they opened the doors to engineers, and now the door is open for all kinds of people, from computer science to scientists like us, to mathematicians, engineers, even medical doctors. So everybody involved in STEM careers can become an astronaut. This is what you need exactly to apply for the position. You need to be a citizen of a member state or an associate member state, have a master's degree or higher in some of these disciplines, and three years of relevant and professional uh, experience. Having a PhD already qualifies you with this kind of professional experience. Of course, knowing English and, uh, if possible, another language, especially French or German. And these are all also other assets that are very valuable, like having a strong motivation because you have to, to cope with irregular working hours. You are going to be traveling the rest of your life, basically. And you will have a long absence from home, so uh, then having a family, a regular social life is going to be really problematic. So you need to be willing to, to cope with that. Uh, also flexible uh, re regarding the place of God because of work because you will have uh, many locations. Keep calm under pressure, and this is may probably the thing that they have assessed the most throughout the process, and willing to participate in life science experiments because you are going to be a test bed yourself. So regarding the physical conditions, 
uh, you just need to meet the requirements to be a private pilot. And this kind of certificates is uh, issued by an aerospace medical agency. You, will, you also need perfect audi audition, uh, normal body mass, you don't need to be an athlete or something like that, and a, a height between 150 and 190 because you need to fit in the youth spacecraft, basically because of that. <laughs> and there are some other assets that are valuable, but that's it. So this is the, the post position, uh, the youth position is like a regular uh, offer. And they, they open two different ones, the vacancy for astronaut, and for the first time in, in, the, in the history, they open a vacancy for an astronaut with a a physical disability. For example, Pablo applied through this position because he has a disability in his left ankle. So you need to upload your CV, a motivation letter, uh, and this certificate of you can meet the requirements for a pri private pilot. And then fill a very, very awkward questionnaire. Really long and really awkward. But they take, took it into account for the decision. And this is the, the process, 18 months, 18 very tough months <laughs> with six different stages. The first one was a, a screening of all the CVs and the questionnaires that they received. There were a lot of applications, um, much many of the, of the number they expected. They told me that they expect around uh, 10,000 and they received more than 23,000 applications. It was crazy. And they assess the CV, your experience, the questionnaire, and the motivation letter. And then some of us were invited to the first, which is the, se the second stage, but it was the first assessment <coughs> test uh, properly tell. So this one uh, was conducted in Hamburg, Germany, and it consisted of cognitive, technical, motor coordination, and personality tests. What's this? Basically, it was a full day, 11 hours of intelligent tests, all kinds of tests. They assess your memory, they assess your concentration capabilities. Uh, there were also um, maths, physics, and English tests, personality tests. It was uh, probably the most difficult stage of all the process uh, because you barely haven't break times between the tests. And after the 11 hours of concentration, uh, they gave us a nice surprise, which was a pretty easy test, the easiest of all of them. But after 11 hours of being answering questions, you had to keep, it's, it's very similar to the psycho, psychotechnical test for driving, for the driving license. You need to keep a dot between two bars with a joystick. <laughs> That's it, during half an hour. After 11 hours of <laughs> testing, I was grabbing the joystick and grabbing my hand, like, Sarah, a few more minutes, please, you, you can do it. You have done something worse before. But it was crazy. It was like a torture after that. Uh, well, interesting day, this one in, in Hamburg. And the third stage for me was the, one of the happiest days in my life. It, it was in, in Cologne. And this was everything a surprise. You, you, didn't know what to expect in this stage. Basically, it consisted in more personality tests, more group dynamics and individual tests. They give you problems and surprises and just fix it and do whatever you can to, to solve unexpected and unforeseen problems. Uh, in this stage, they have a very thoughtful psychological profiling. I have two hours interview with a psychologist and psychiatrist, and a panel interview with people from my HR and some astronauts. And I find, found out that after the 10 hours of assessing this day, the, the magic question was asked to the astronaut in the panel interview. They asked him or her, well, him, were him all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, would you spend six months with this person on board the ISS, and if the astronaut said, yes, I do, I would, you passed. <laughs> if he hesitated, well, it may be, <laughs> it may be a stack of CVs. But it was a very interesting day. Uh, people get really frustrated from this stage with some of the, of the tests because they are tests uh, prepared to be impossible to solve. 
So you just need to keep a good communication skills with your team members and keep calm. That's the, the main point of the test because you cannot pass it. It's impossible. This is the, the tricky part of the, of the assessment. The, sorry, the fourth stage were the medicals. And here people get pretty confused because you, I think most of us, myself included, thought that you need to be like a superhero or an athlete to be an astronaut. And that's not the reality. You just need to be healthy, really healthy. Because in on board of the ISA, uh, you cannot have a rescue mission if you have some kind of medical condition or some issue uh, comes up when you're in a, in a mission. You need to, to be your own doctor. You need to fix your problem. So they cannot take the risk of having an astronaut that can develop some kind of medical condition when he or she is in a mission. So they assess basically everything you can assess in a human being. I was five days in Toulouse in MEDES, which is a, a center for aerospace medicine. And I've, I had ultrasounds, an array of all the different parts of my body, uh, five hours of assessing things regarding my eyes, audiometries, uh, everything, DEXA for my bone and muscle index, effort tests as well. But it was the only fitness uh, related test, the, the effort, but it was more for um, conditions related to the heart, more than if, to check if you are fit or not fit. That's it, you just need to be healthy. What happened is that most of the candidates that we made it through, through until this stage are people very sporty, very active, so all of us were fit and healthy. The, the fifth stage for me was the worst. It, that was like, like a boxing combat. It was crazy. It was a panel interview in Cologne, too, in the European Astronaut Center. And you have to face a, a lot of ESA directors. And they, yes, want you to push you to the edge, till the edge, to make you lose your temper, to make you lose your confidence. And you just need to, to cope with that, to keep calm, to keep on answering questions without losing your temper. And there were also a lot of technical and what if questions. For example, a, one of the people in the panel was the the director of the International Space Station from the wing. And he started to ask questions, what would you do if you detect a leakage in the International Space Station and you are the commander? How do you fix it? Which are the steps you will follow? Uh, these are the technical questions, but then very pressing, very pressing and hard questions. I tried to keep my smile throughout the, the interview, but <laughs> when they basically <laughs> stuck the, the, the door be, behind me. I just have a, a small tear running through my cheek. I'm feeling completely stupid after the interview, but that was the main goal of the interview, just to push you, and you have to endure it, to hold, to withstand with all the questions, because in the end, it's another exercise. And finally, the final boss, <laughs> literally, was the director general of the of the Sp uh, European Space Agency. This interview was held in Paris in the headquarters of ESA. It was a much nicer interview compared with the previous one, but it was also kind of difficult. Uh, for example, one of the questions was, you have three minutes to convince Pedro Sanchez to invest 300 million in ESA. How will you do it? <laughs> Click timer. <Yeah>. So. Uh, <laughs> Let's discuss about it, but it was, I really enjoyed the, this interview. It was myself and I tried to, yes, enjoy the process. It has been a, a, a very long and, sorry, <laughs> and tough process. These are the, the figures of the people that started uh, in all the, the, fechi, in the, the stages. Uh, in the upper part are the astronaut vacancy and in the lower, the para-astronaut process. And the, the final outcome. But I have to confess that uh, I never considered to, to get it. I mean, and becoming an astronaut was never the main goal. I just wanted to enjoy the process, to enjoy the experience and learn something in the journey because the chances were extremely low. I mean, it's like buying a lottery ticket. You are not expecting to, to win. You fantasize with that, but you cannot really assume it like a 
professional career in the future. In the end, you can make it. Here is the, the example, but it was never the main goal. And this process has already changed my life, regardless that I made it. If I was to stop here or there or there, it would be worth it completely. Believe me, it's an amazing experience. And finally, we, we made it. We were 17 of us. Uh, this was announced uh, last Wednesday in the Council Ministerial in Paris. And we were basically locked down in a hotel two hours away from Paris because they, was, uh, they didn't want the press to uh, get pictures of us and get some kind of leakage of the possible astronaut, uh, new class of astronauts. So we were three days locked there. Uh, Luckily, the hotel was very nice, so at least we have a pool and a gym to enjoy and spend some, some time. And uh, we were moved to the ministerial in cars. We used the, the door of the Grand Palais Ephemer in Paris that only Macron can use. <laughs> they were completely paranoid with the press. And it was a very, a very nice, a very, very nice day, this one, when they announced. So from the almost 23,000 uh, applications, in the end we have 17 astronauts, new astronauts, after 13 years, because I didn't tell it this, but the, the previous vacancy for astronaut was in 2009. So this is not a, a job position that opens pretty often. You need to take this train, this opportunity, because who knows, maybe you are too old for the next one. So now what? What is going to happen? Uh, in this uh, ESA astronaut class, there are like three categories. This is the first time that ESA does something like that. We have five career astronauts, and this has a, an explanation. It's because there are only flight, uh, um, five flight opportunities that they can assure. I mean, they're going to spend a lot of money on time uh, training these astronauts. And you cannot train 17 people and not be sure that they are going to have a, a space mission. So they have only hired as a staff, as a ESA staff, the people that for sure will go to the International Space Station. Uh, this, the ISAs will last until 2013, and the first astronaut will have uh, their first mission in 2026. So only five for now. But we will have also the astronaut reserve, which I belong to. And in this kind of reserve, we are not going to substitute an astronaut in case they cannot fly. This is not the main goal. The, the purpose of the reserve is if a new flight opportunity arises, which is something very plausible, actually, some of the reserve will go. And if the government of any of the member states want to develop a new technology or a new scientific project on board of the ISAs, uh, they will use their own astronauts. So if Spain want to do some kind of mission, I will go to the ISS. And well, as far as I know, they won't. <laughs> so I'm very positive. In the meantime, uh, the career astronaut will start, uh, start the basic training of, on April. And uh, the astronaut of the reserve will have like uh, one, two weeks of basic training yearly we need to, keep, to maintain our medical certificates, in, so we will have to go one week there for the, this medical testing I told you about. And we are like external consultants. I have between 20 and 30 days per year uh, performing different tasks for the ESA, from outreach activities to lectures, talks, or I, even myself, I can act like, uh, as a test bed for different kind of uh, health experiments uh, performed in Colombo for example. And once they have, there are a new flight opportunity, I will have to stop my work for two, three, four years and start the basic training, perform the mission, and then come back. Like a Batman, when I receive the signal, I will go and then I will keep on with my things. And for the first time, we have a upper astronaut, a one man with a, a will he will try to develop this study, the feasibility study, which aim to be if we can send people with disability to the, to the space. In the end, Pablo was selected as career astronaut because his disability is really mild and he can perform all the tasks. 
So he belongs to this category and I'm in the reserve until a new opportunity arise. And sorry, this is the, the basic training. It lasts like six years of training. The basic one, you will have to learn almost everything related to the programs of the ESA, uh, stuff related to engineering, science fundamentals. You, in the past, you had to learn Russian. Now, since we don't collaborate with the Roscosmos anymore, maybe this is not on the board anymore. Then you will have your pre-assignment training and this, uh, the length of this training varies a lot because uh, you will be in this phase until you have your own mission assigned. And once you have your mission, you start the increment training. Just focus on the purposes you are going to develop during your mission. And this increment training is between one and two years in very different locations. Um, basically, you don't have any life during this training from Monday to Sunday. Throughout two years, you are traveling and training until you go to the space, but it's pretty amazing. And these are the different locations when astronauts will have to, to learn and do part of their training. And a very interesting kind of training that I will try to participate in is caves, which are some kind of training uh, of speleology, speleology in caves, and also the Pangea program to learn about the geology of Earth, Moon, Mars, in different locations throughout the Earth. So pretty interesting and very cool job, actually. And finally, these are the destinies of the astronaut. Most of them, especially from this promotion, they have to have a first mission in the International Space Station. But since ESA is contributing to the Gateway Space Station, which will be orbiting the, the moon, and the Orion capsule from NASA, which the European Service Model, they have booked three tickets for European astronauts to the missions Artemis to the moon. So we will have several as a European astronauts on the moon in the next few years. And hopefully one Spanish astronaut will put their feet on the moon. And now I will leave. We have five minutes for questions, but I would be glad to answer all your questions in the cafeteria throughout the hour. So wherever you want, just stop me and, and ask me whatever you want to know. Questions, of course. No one goes first. <laughs> A very quick one. First, congratulations. Thank we are you. all proud of this, really. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's not that I'm thinking in applying, but it's not any limitation of age? Yes, there is. Uh, but they have um, opened the age range in this, uh, in this application until 50. Basically, because you, you are going to spend at least six years in training. So if you, have, you want to have at least two missions, you will need to be in this range. But curiously, most of us are between 33 and 36, most of the 17. Well, Sarah, congratulations. It's really a great achievement. Uh, I have a question regarding the, you mentioned that there is a, in, in Germany, there is like a, um, mm -hmm. at the ESA, there is a place where there are experiments under microgravity, uh, or can you tell us more about which kind of experiments are done in, in space? Or? Yeah, uh, the International Space Station is composed by very different models. They have like an American sector, the Russian sector, the Canadian sector, we have a lot of different modules and Europe has contributed with several of those. One of the most important is the Columbus Laboratory that is used from all the different agencies throughout the world. And uh, uh, in fact, the burdening of the time of using of the International Space Station is related to this kind of use. Uh, Europe uh, allows people from NASA uses the Columbus and they can have a, a SpaceX rockets to launch European astronauts to the International Space Station. So some kind of experiments that they are doing. For example, uh, they, had, they have done a lot of very interesting stuff related to vaccines. 
because when you remove gravity from the equation and you can perform this kind of experiments in microgravity, the viruses get more virulent. So it's uh, easier and faster to develop more uh, potent, more powerful vaccines using this kind of microgravity. This is one example for it. Regarding age, maybe Fernando, you remember that uh, uh, Astro Pedro Duque, he, 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 had a, he went into a flight with John Glenn, who was already very old at the time. <laughs> So, well, congratulations, Sara. So you're going to be you, like, uh, you know, a role model for <laughs> many people. So, I mean, well, I have many questions, but one, I guess, the, so uh, in, in the different phases that you went through, uh, mm -hmm. so the first one probably was very important, but was you have many candidates yes. and they just narrow down to, to mm -hmm. a lot. So you probably wrote a very kind of uh, impressive uh, cover letter. letter. Yeah. I don't know if you can share that. But this is very private. And it's no, very no, emotional. I, but <laughs> I, I didn't mean that so to share the whole thing. But, but if you can tell people, where were the, the keywords? So how did you impress? Or what do you think that was so um, different and, and yeah. unique from your letter that you wrote? Basically, I started telling that whoever wanted to be an astronaut, well, I didn't. <laughs> this is my beginning of the motivation letter. Uh, what I just try to do is um, convince them that my experience as a scientist, but not just as a scientist, as an explorer, because I like to, to try all kind of different things. I, and everything that fears me, I just to face it. I want to face it and overcome my, my fears. So all my experience as a friend, as a student, as a daughter, as a scientist, as a whatever, have uh, equipped me with some kind of a skill set that matches what, with what you want, and I will prove it. For example, you want people that can manage the risk. Okay, I can, because in my work I do this and that and all this kind of yeah, stuff. Okay. Yeah, so I just um, uh, score all the, all the skills and assets they are looking in an astronaut profile, and I give them experience from my own life that have prepared me to, to do that. So it's kind of thing with an emotional touch, of course, because it's a motivational letter. <laughs> but yeah, you and I, I can share, I wouldn't mind. Right, Sarah. So I, I just wanted to remark how impressive your, your achievement is, because you know it's easier in Europe to be a, a prime minister of a country than to be an astronaut. There's more prime ministers yeah, than Yeah, the, the chances are quite, <laughs> quite low, actually. <laughs> And actually, my specific question is about the future. I, I'm very interested in this thing mm -hmm. that you said that you were asked, how would you convince your prime minister to invest in ESA mm -hmm. in three minutes? And that I figured your chances of going to space will depend on the commitment that the Spanish government mm -hmm. invests in, in NASA. And, exactly. and actually, because this is a multi-year path, you know, you will, I guess you will have to deal with this administration and a different administration, maybe. Yeah, so what are your... Sure. your your thoughts about this? Uh, who is going to help you promote the political part of this of, of this yeah, mission? Yeah, this is a tricky question. But we are in the very beginning, so we have time to discuss it. But it's a question that the DG, the Director General, asked me: If you are in the research, would you lobby with your government to push them to invest in ESA and promote a space mission for you? And I told him, No, I won't. Because I don't want, I feel bad if they have to pay for a museum because I want to fly. It's, but this is not the goal. I mean, all the investment that is done in space have a, it come back to our country because you're investing in development, in technology, you are preparing new collaboration with industry. And in the end, I think the, the return is about 3.5 for each euro invested in the space. So we have a good project to develop we, have, we can pre um, prepare new collaborations, of course, I will push to that. And they want to do it because it will be even like a figure to have the first female uh, in a, a space female astronaut in a space mission would be very interesting also to inspire the young generation to increase the, the people that developed in STEM careers. And that's good for our country. So we will see, but in the meantime, we need to figure out which are the duty of the astronauts of the reserve, and it's something that we are already discussing with ISA. But yeah, I am very optimistic about that. And I have talked to the government and the people involved in that, and they want me to, to have a mission. 
Any more questions? Not from the first line, because they are <laughs> not from the bosses. One, two. Uh, we start here, and then we go there. Hi, Sarah. So um, I, I didn't get that from, the, from your talk, but uh, the fact that you are a scientist and a, a cancer research scientist, do you think that could influence the kind of tasks you would have uh, there if you ever fly? Uh, or is it just that the uh, agency has like very, very defined um, experiments that they want to perform there, no matter who is the astronaut? Uh, I would like to think that, but probably it, it doesn't going to affect the, the result. I mean, uh, you just need to demonstrate that you have the, the potential to develop your duties as an astronaut. I want to believe that if there is a very specific mission related to cancer, they, they will ask me to do it, hopefully. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, in, now we are all the same. But I will leverage the background of each uh, astronaut from the reserve to a specific mission. But we cannot uh, forget that the, the missions are developed here from PIs in the academia. So I, I won't in, want to interfere with what they have designed. This is also something that they asked me interview, in the interview. You are a scientist. How are you going to deal with the fact that you are not going to design the experiments? You just have to perform them. And I said, OK, I will be a technician. Um, I will be glad with, <laughs> with that, of course. But I, I will never do it. I mean, I have to trust in the PIs. They are very intelligent and clever people behind this kind of, of scientific project. So I tr fully believe in what they have done. Thank you. Hello, yes, Ramon. Just a curiosity, apart from the scientific uh, uh, reasons to go <laughs> yeah, Plan for that? The, Would that be a, the ugliest a, part a of, of the task tasks? <laughs> uh, most of the spare time during the weekends is uh, devoted to that, to no, clean it. I mean, I mean, the, the, the the pieces of, of space rubbish that are... Ah, the debris, the, the space debris. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I was in another air. Uh, yeah, there is a huge problem, and ISA right now is doing a lot of different things to solve and to fix this kind of problem. The first thing, we need a traffic, uh, space traffic management system, because uh, each time there are more and more satellites, and the maneuvers to avoid collisions are very expensive. Uh, uh, they spend a lot of fuel, which is a very precious <laughs> resource in space, to move the satellites uh, and avoid collisions. So it's something, something to, to need to be fixed. And there is like an initiative called EcoSpace, which is meant to, to fix this kind of thing and prepare some kind of satellites that when they have the re-entry on Earth, they don't leave any debris behind. Uh, they are working a lot of that because it's a very huge problem. Actually, it's one of the three main goals of the agenda of ESA, which is protect the assets and have a, an eco system in the space because we relied on low Earth orbit. Most of the satellites we use daily are there. We cannot afford losing them. So there are a lot of things doing with that. One last question because unfortunately we have to finish, but we, there will be plenty of opportunities outside. <laughs> Uh, we know the salary of the scientist. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, motivation. I, I don't want to know uh, yeah. what is the, the, the salary of uh, an astronaut, but it's a kind of something that can motivate, I hope so. It depends. Uh, we, we met with the astronauts from the class of 2009, and they told us the salary, well, considering that you are going to lose your life, uh, it's not so high. Well, for scientists, it's going to be a huge improvement. It's going to, okay. Yeah, I, I saw the salary for career astronauts. I know at that point. And it's around 6,000, 8,000, but are free of taxes because you're an international astronaut. In my case, it's not that at all. It's a consultancy contract, so I will be paid for each day that I spend through ESA. But most of it is going to be volunteer uh, work. 
everything that I'm doing now is volunteer. Um, yeah, yeah. I will have to use my vacation time to do this kind of task. So, well, at least it's awesome still. So it's Congratulations. Thanks, Sarah, for, for being here. Uh, thanks to all for coming. But as I say, yeah, I, I'm yeah. sure there will be more <laughs> opportunities because I'm sure there are many more <laughs> questions to be made. Thank okay. you very much. And congratulations. Thank you.